So we're going to continue our discussion of liquids and solids, and we're going to look at section 5, which involves vapor pressure and then changes of states. We're going to look at changing from liquid to solid to gas. So let's talk about vapor pressure first. So some vocab terms, vaporization or evaporation is going from a liquid to a gas. This is an endothermic process. Energy is required to overcome those intermolecular forces, the forces between the compounds and break them apart and allow it to go from a liquid to a gas. Heat of vaporization or enthalpy of vaporization, which is delta H VAP, is the energy required to vaporize one mole of a liquid at a pressure of one atmosphere. And this is very important for water. Condensation is basically the reverse. So we're going from a gas to a liquid. It's condensing. Equilibrium occurs when the rate of condensation is equal to the rate of vaporization. So we're converting between liquid and gas at an equal rate. Okay, so equilibrium vapor pressure then is the pressure of the vapor that is present at equilibrium when that even rate of liquid to gas is occurring. And we can use a barometer to measure the vapor pressure of a liquid, and we usually use mercury. So in some of our labs, we have looked at inches of mercury, which we can then convert to millimeters of mercury, which is equal to torr, and then we can convert that to atmospheres. So the pressure of the atmosphere is equal to the vapor pressure plus the pressure um, of mercury in the column. And so basically when we use a barometer, we're solving for, we can solve for vapor pressure. So liquids that have a high vapor pressure are going to evaporate really rapidly, and those are called volatile. Uh, alcohol is an example, like rubbing alcohol, it evaporates relatively quickly. So vapor pressure is determined by the size of the intermolecular forces. Okay, really strong intermolecular forces have a low vapor pressure. You can also lower the vapor pressure if you have a large molar mass, because if we're talking about London dispersion forces, as the molar mass increases or the molecule gets larger slash bigger, the forces increase, which means higher intermolecular forces. Okay, so we can also calculate vapor pressure and look at the relationship between vapor pressure and temperature. Vapor pressure increases as temperature increases, but it is nonlinear, meaning it will not form a straight line. And if you look at this graph at the bottom here, that's what we're talking about. So you can see that as vapor pressure increases and temperature increases, we have this curved line. And really, it doesn't matter what our substance is. It's just we're going to have you know different pressures and temperatures. But it's following a similar curved pattern. So we need a large kinetic energy, which remember is related to temperature, to overcome these strong intermolecular forces. And to get a straight line, we have to plot natural log of the vapor pressure versus one over the temperature, and that is what we're doing in this equation. And so real quick, let me point out that this is the slope, because we're going to want that to know that in a few minutes. OK, so remember, R is our gas constant. C is new. C is a constant characteristic of the given liquid. And so that would need to be given. You can determine the delta H vaporization by measuring the vapor pressure at several temperatures and then plotting your results. Or if you know the delta H vaporization and the vapor pressure at one temperature, you can then use the equation to calculate the vapor pressure at any other temperature. Um, and C doesn't depend on T. Remember, C is just based on the given liquid. Whoops, let's go back for a sec. So um, we can use, basically, we can also put this equation together where we're, this is what we're doing right here. We're knowing the vapor pressure at a specific temperature, and then we can find the new vapor pressure at a separate temperature. And if we plot natural log of pressure versus 1 over temperature, then we get these straight lines. And the slope is equal to negative delta H vaporization over R. So basically, since R is going to be the same for all of them, the line with the steepest slope is going to have the largest delta H vaporization, okay, which relates to our example. And so if you wanted to determine whether water or diethyl ether had the larger enthalpy of vaporization, you would need to plot a natural log of P versus 1 over T. And then whichever one had the largest slope, so the steepest line, that's going to be the one with the largest heat of vaporization. 
Oh, okay, so let's say we want to calculate a new vapor pressure based on information that we know. So we know the vapor pressure of water at 25 Celsius is 23.8 torr, and we know the heat of vaporization, that delta H, is 43.9 kilojoules per mole. So we want to calculate the vapor pressure of water at a new temperature at 50 Celsius. Okay, well, make sure that we're using this equation to relate those two temperatures and pressures to each other. And then the last thing that we're going to need to do, because this is the natural log, we're going to need to do the anti-log, which remember is that e to the x. So try this one on your own. Go ahead and pause the video, remembering that we also want to put our temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so go ahead and pause, and then um, I'll give you the answer then. Okay, so hopefully you've paused and tried this on your own, and hopefully you ended up with 93.7 torr as your new pressure at a temperature of 50 Celsius. And we'll go over this in class. Okay, so solids can also have vapor pressures, and so this is what happens when something sublimates, when it turns directly from a solid to a gas. For example, carbon dioxide or dry ice will do this uh, quite often. Okay, and so we've been talking about vapor pressure and changing from solid to liquid to gas. So let's look at that a little bit more. We can draw what's called a heating curve to represent that process of going from a solid to a liquid to a gas. And basically, we are plotting temperature versus time. So we are adding heat over the course of time. Uh, and look at what happens as we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Okay, so we have some vocab words on here as well. So the melting point is the temperature at which something melts. It goes from a solid to a liquid. And so if you notice, melting is occurring at this plateau. And so what that means is although the temperature is not increasing at this point, we have to continue to add heat. And that's where this breaking of those intermolecular forces is occurring. The heat of fusion, or the enthalpy of fusion, is the enthalpy change that occurs at that melting point. So we're increasing the heat, okay, and so we can look at how much heat is required to go from a solid to a liquid. And the boiling point, very similar, instead of being melting, it's boiling, so the temperature at which something boils, okay, and we can measure that across and find that value, just like we can measure across and find the melting point. Melting point and boiling point are determined by the vapor pressure of the liquid and the solid, so that plays a role here. A melting point is the point where the liquid and the solid have equal vapor pressures. So we would say that they are at equilibrium, their vapor pressures are the same. Okay, so a couple other more specific definitions that we can get into. If we have what's called normal melting point, this is the temperature at which solid and liquid states, remember we said they have to have the same vapor pressure, but now we're adding one other point here, which is that the total pressure has to equal one atmosphere, and that's considered the normal melting point. The normal boiling point is the temperature at which vapor pressure of a liquid is one atmosphere exactly. If So at less than one atmosphere, no bubbles will form because the pressure on the surface of the liquid is greater than the pressure in the spaces of the liquid, and so those bubbles aren't going to be able to form and come up to the top. So we can also supercool something. This is when it's cooled below zero Celsius at one atmosphere, but yet it's still a liquid. And so we're cooling it very quickly, and this means that the structure cannot get organized into a solid form, and so it's still a liquid. We can also superheat something, which means we raise it to a temperature above the boiling point of the liquid. When this occurs, the vapor pressure of the liquid is greater than the atmospheric pressure, so now we have kind of the opposite of what we talked about up here. And what can happen is that bubbles will form, but now they can't escape. So we have the opposite system happening here. They can't escape because of that difference in vapor pressure. And so this is called bumping. And so basically it will break your glassware because those bubbles have nowhere to go. And so what you can do to prevent that is add what are called boiling chips. And these are just little pieces of ceramic material. They're porous, so they have some holes in them. And those help create these starter bubbles which then allow those bubbles to escape so that you don't have this problem going on. Okay, so uh, next we're going to talk about phase diagrams. So um, that'll be in the next lesson. So hope you have a good day.